This lesson is the start of a new section in biology, population ecology or population studies. I'll do a few videos on this section. This one is the first video. So what is population ecology? Well, ecology is the study of the interactions of organisms with their physical and biological environments <clears throat> and how these determine the distribution and makeup of populations within an ecosystem. Population ecology is the fluctuation, so the changes in the size of a population and the factors, both physical and social, that regulate these fluctuations. When we talk about a physical um, environments, we can also call them abiotic environments. And when we talk about biological environments, so the living environments, we might call them biotic environments. Individuals live together in populations. Different populations together make up a community. Communities, together with all the non-living, so the abiotic things in their surroundings, make up an ecosystem. And all the ecosystems on Earth, Earth make up the biosphere. These terms are all really important terms to know for this section. And you can read them through here. I'm not going to read through them, but you can just pause the slide. These definitions are quite important to know. So what does affect the size of a population? Well, the population size is the total number of individuals in a population. That's really self-explanatory. It can increase or decrease over time with a change in one or more of the following. These four are really important. Natality, which is the birth rate in animals or the production of seeds in plants. Mortality, which is the death rate. Immigration, individuals moving into a population and staying. And emigration, individuals leaving a population and not returning. For humans, when we talk about the birth rate, we talk about it as the number of births per 1,000 people in a year. For death rate, it's the number of deaths per 1,000 people in a year. So if the death rate was um, three, that would mean that on average, three people out of every 1,000 people would die per year. Obviously, a lower death rate um, means a healthier, safer, etc. population. Um, one thing I just want to focus on for this slide, going back a little bit, is the difference between um, a population of organisms and a species of organisms. So a population is a group of organisms of the same species that are found in a particular area and can crossbreed freely. So the humans, there isn't, um, okay, humans is maybe a bad example because of um, technology and all that sort of thing and flights and everything. But for example, uh, elephants. There's not one population of elephants on earth. There's multiple, multiple different populations because say the Kruger elephants could be one population. The elephants in um, Addo Elephant Park in the Eastern Cape are a different population. The elephants in Kenya, in Botswana, they're all different populations because they've not found all in the same area. And the elephants in Kruger and the ones in Kenya can't crossbreed freely. They don't have access to each other. They can't mate and produce offspring. That means that they're different populations. So when we talk about populations, that's um, a, a term for a group of individuals that can crossbreed freely and that are found within the same area. So just keep that in mind when we talk about like population studies and et cetera. And then a community is a group of populations. So in, for example, the Kruger Park, there's obviously a population of elephants, of impala, of lions, of uh, acacia trees, of fish, of birds. All these groups of populations together are called a community. A species is different from a population because there's only, the, even if they're not in the same population, individuals can be in the same species. They just have to be, um, have similar characteristics and able to produce fertile offspring. That's really important. So all the impala in the world, okay, well, I don't know if they're actually multiple species of impala, but for example, the impala in Kenya, the impala in South Africa, the impala in Botswana, they're all part of the same species because if you did put them together, they could produce fertile offspring, but they're not part of the same population because they're not actually together. They're not actually crossbreeding freely. That's just important to know some of those words. Um, populations we know will grow when the birth rate, so the natality and the immigration are greater than the death rate and the emigration. They'll decline when death and immigration are greater than birth and immigration. And they'll be stable when birth and immigration are roundabout equal to death and immigration. 
When we say a population is a closed population, that means that there's no immigration or emigration, so mo no movement in or out of a population. That's a closed population. That means that the only parameters, these four things are parameters, the only parameters that affect a change in the population numbers are births and deaths. How is the growth of a population regulated? So if a few individuals enter an unoccupied area where there's no shortage of food or other resources and no predators, they'll reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and the number of individuals will increase exponentially. So let's say we start with uh, two individuals, a male and a female. If they enter an unoccupied area, let's say we're talking about uh, cats. If two cats, a male and a female, enter an unoccupied area, so there are no other cat there, cat there, there's no shortage of food, so for example, mice and milk and water and all that sort of thing, no shortage of other resources, and there are no predators, nothing killing the cats. Then these cats will reproduce and the number of individuals will increase exponentially. So the first two cats will reproduce. Let's say they then produce four young. Let's say that the young, this is, might be a little bit of a bad example because two is a little bit small to start off with, but let's say that the young can interbreed within each other um, and then each of the young produce their own four cats. Now we have, um, okay, if we had uh, two females of the young, now we have eight new babies. Now within those babies, we have four females. So when they reproduce, we're going to have 16 and we're going to go from two cats to four cats to eight cats to 16 and so on. And you can see that it's going to increase exponentially, keeping in mind that there are no predators and no shortage of food or other resources. So there's nothing causing the um, cats to die. That's why their population increases like that exponentially. Um, as the numbers increase, more demands are made on the available resource, and this builds up environmental resistance. Environmental resistance causes the birth rate or the immigration rate to decrease, so the rate at which the population grows to decrease, and the death rate or the emigration rate to increase. Environmental resistance is the total number of factors that stop a population from reproducing at its maximum rate. So the rate of growth of the population would be the slope of this line. So its maximum rate would be around there when it slopes at its steepest. Environmental resistance stops it from going continually up, up, up and just producing on forever because obviously the number of resources, the food is going to um, run out. There's not going to be enough food for a million cats or whatever the example is. That's why um, environmental resistance comes into play and the population slows down. So if this on the y-axis is um, the number of organisms and this in the x-axis is time. You start off increasing exponentially as the resources are freely available and um, reproduction can occur freely. Then environmental resistance comes into play and slows down. And we see here we reach like a, um, a stable phase, which we call carrying capacity. So eventually a balance is reached and the population stabilizes at a particular size or number. This number is the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. Carrying capacity is the population density that the, eco, that the environment can support. So how many organisms can the environment actually support and produce resources for without it being continually damaged by there being too many organisms using up the resources? Population will usually fluctuate around the carrying capacity, so go up and down slightly, until the environment changes. Population size fluctuates seasonally and annually depending on the resources available. The population size in an ecosystem is self-regulating, so it's a negative feedback mechanism. So what happens is it doesn't need um, another factor to regulate it. It self-regulates the population. So as it increases, the resources are used up, so the population decreases. As it decreases a little bit, there's now more resources allowing it to increase and it'll eventually fluctuate up and down. That's why we say it's self-regulating. So we can see here that it increases exponentially at first, it then reaches the carrying capacity and it fluctuates around the carrying capacity. But even though it's fluctuating slightly, we, stay, we say that it is stable because you can see that it's always at a similar level around the carrying capacity. Um, and this is just another diagram. Um, some limiting factors. The factors that help regulate the growth of the population. So that means keep the population from growing too um, large. 
there's two types of limiting factors. They're either density independent or density dependent factors. Density independent factors are factors that limit the growth of the population as a result of natural factors and not because of the number of the organisms. So they'll affect the population numbers, whether there's three animals or a thousand animals. It doesn't matter how big the population is. These are factors like physical factors, so rainfall, temperature, humidity, and so on, and catastrophic events, so natural disasters, floods, fire, droughts, etc. And you can see that obviously if there were uh, 10 giraffes in a population or 300 giraffes in a population, if there's a fire, it's going to regulate the population. It's going to have an effect on how many individuals there are and probably decrease the number of individuals. Density dependent factors are factors that have a greater effect when the population density is high. So when there's a large number of organisms, um, it's usually triggered by the, op uh, the overpopulation. And this is quite important because there's a lot of density dependent factors that could happen uh, relating to the overpopulation of humans. So density dependent factors would be a lack of resources because more organisms mean there's more competition for resources, things like food, light, oxygen, water, space, and shelter. Um, organisms, when there's a lot of organisms, they're also more easily found by predators. So they may be more likely to be killed, even though for one individual, it's safer to be in a group of 100 impala than to be in a group of three impala. Um, Overall, it's easier for a predator to find a group of 100 impala than to find a group of three impala. That's why it's a density dependent factor. Another density dependent factor is the spread of disease and parasites, because when there's a big group, disease spreads more rapidly. So the outbreak of the disease, where the disease actually, when it starts, that's a density independent factor. But the um, spread of the disease happens a lot quicker in a a big population. That's why it's density dependent. And obviously we can see that um, with like coronavirus, if you're related to current day, obviously the population numbers aren't changing drastically, but by going into lockdown and by isolating ourselves, disease is less easily spread because there's less uh, crowding in, in uh, public areas and that sort of thing. And these limiting factors altogether build up environmental resistance. So there's two types of population. They can be stable or unstable. Stable is a population that fluctuates around the carrying capacity. So like this diagram, you can see that they relatively stay around the carrying capacity. An unstable population develops when the population far exceeds the carrying capacity. The habitat then deteriorates rapidly because there's too, way too many individuals and they're using up resources way too quickly. That means that the carrying capacity then lowers. So the organism, I mean, the environment can actually only support fewer individuals because so many resources have been used up. And because the carrying capacity drops, the population also drops because there's so few resources and it could eventually lead to um, extinction. So we can see here, this is an unstable population where it far exceeds the carrying capacity. Resources are used up, so the carrying capacity decreases. That makes the population have to decrease because there's so few resources and it could have a knock-on effect on other populations. For example, if this was an impala uh, population graph and they used, they um, ate too many resources, for example, grass, then other populations like kudu populations, elephant population, or um, browsers or grazers, that sort of thing, their populations may also decrease because there's fewer resources. When you determine population size, they'll often ask you in an exam to, um, to the um, to use a technique to determine the size of a population. It can be determined by direct or indirect methods. The choice regarding the method is determined by the size of the organisms and the mobility of the organisms. So a direct method would literally just be counting all the individuals in the population. It's only used where the organisms are large enough to be seen very clearly and where the, um, the area in which the animals are being counted is not too large. Uh, the animals need to be preferably sl slow moving or stationary and they usually need to, or they need to um, stay in a fixed position. So you can't um, do a direct technique in a massive area, say the Kruger Park, for lions which aren't that well seen from let's say the air. 
Um, and also because obviously lions will move pretty quickly. So something like that's not going to work. But something like snails in a small area will work. Plants is obviously a good example because plants aren't going to move. Um, when we do a direct method and we count all the individuals, this is called a census. You can do different census methods. You can do direct contact counting when they're smaller sized individuals, or we do it for humans. You can do a direct counting from vehicle or helicopter or plane. This is usually of larger organisms. And you can do counting from aerial photographs taken of larger moving organisms. They'll often do this for things like um, elephant, rhino, giraffe, buffalo, that sort of thing. Then the second way to do it is indirect method. These are usually the ones that are asked as calculations in a test. They involve the counting of only part of the population. And then we use this count as a sample to determine the total estimated population size by statistical calculation. So by kind of extrapolating the data. There's two ways. You can do the mark recapture technique or the quadrant technique. In the mark recapture technique, this is the process. We demarcate a specific area. In, within that area, a number of individuals are caught, counted, and marked. They're known as the first sample. They're usually marked by something like a, um, a band on them or a spot of paint or something like that. And they're then released back into the environment. They're then given sufficient time to, be, um, to mix with the rest of the population, but it's important it can't be too much time so that births and deaths um, will influence the numbers. So it's usually around about three days. After this time, a second group of individuals is caught within the same area. And these individuals are again counted and they're known as the second sample. They're not marked, but within the second sample, you look at how many individuals that have been captured in the second sample have been marked from the first sample. So we know how many of these individuals in the second sample were the ones that we also caught in the first sample. And then you do this calculation. P is equal to MS over T. P is the estimated population size. So this is what you're solving for. M is the total number of animals captured and marked in the first sample. S is the total number of animals captured in the second sample. And T is the total number of marked individuals in the second sample. So T is basically how many individuals do we capture in both the first and the second sample. Um, to do an example, Someone wanted to determine the size of a beetle population in a demarcated area. They caught a sample of 50 beetles in the first sample and they applied a spot of paint to each beetle. These marked beetles were put back into the area, allowed to move around freely, and two days later, 90 beetles were caught in the same area. So the first sample was 50 beetles, now the second sample is 90 beetles. Five of these 90 beetles were marked with a spot of paint. So that means that five beetles from um, that were captured in the first capture were also captured in the second capture. Now, how do we determine the size of the population? Well, we know that P is equal to M times S over T. Always write out this formula. If you can try and give a key or write it out in the actual words, like population is equal to number of animals in first sample times in second sample, etc. So we know we've got 50 from the first sample times 90 from the second sample divided by the number of animals that were marked and captured in the second sample, which is five. 50 times 90 over five is 900. And you can't just leave your answer as 900, 900 what? 900 beetles, that's what we're measuring. So that's the mark recapture technique. Um, there's some precautions that must be taken for the, the results to be reliable and valid. Um, as I said, there must be a short time between the first and the second sampling, so no or a negligible amount of births and deaths can occur. Try to repeat the sampling several times and do an average population. They won't really do this and make you, to make you do this in the test, but if they ask you what precautions could be taken, you can use this. Don't let the marking damage or injure the individual or affect its movement or behavior, because if the mark, um, um, let's say that you put a, a, a band on the animal's leg, but now the animal can't walk properly, then that means that it might um, not move far enough away from your um, initial capture site. So it might come back and be more likely to be captured a second time around than other individuals. And also, if you put this mark on its leg and it can't walk properly, what if it's then um, more likely to be captured by predators, which will mean that it's more likely to have a higher death rate? 
Um, so things like that, obviously you've got to take precautions from, or like a spotted paint, make sure that it doesn't make it more uh, visible to predators. But the marks must be clearly visible for the duration of the investigation. They can't be uh, rubbed off between the first and the second sampling because otherwise you might capture an individual whose paint had rubbed off and then you think it's a new individual. It must be allowed to mix freely with the rest of the population before a new sample is taken and it must happen in a closed population, no immigration or emigration. The second technique is the quadrant technique. A quadrant is usually a square frame of metal or wood or plastic of a known specific size, usually one meter squared. The area where the organisms must be counted is demarcated and the surface area is determined. So the area um, uh, in which the organism is being counted. The quadrant is placed on the ground in the demarcated area and the organisms concerned are counted inside the metal frame or whatever frame the, the quadrant is. This is the number of individuals per unit area. So for example, per one meter squared. Then you then repeat this process a few times in different areas of the demarcated area. So the demarcated area is usually um, a lot bigger than the quadrant area. And then you average the number of individuals per quadrant. Uh, it must be random sampling, sampling so that each member of the population has an equal and independent chance of being included. Random sampling eliminates bias. Um, the formula for the quadrant technique is the would be population size is equal to the average number of individuals per quadrant which we calculated or we would have calculated, times the surface area of the entire habitat, so the whole demarcated habitat, divided by the surface area of each quadrant. So for example, a gardener wanted to find out how many snails there were in his garden. His whole garden covered an area of 40 meters squared. Using a 0.5 meter squared quadrant, he randomly selected six sample areas, randomly selected, that's important, and counted the snails in each. The following numbers were counted. Within each of the quadrants, there were seven, 16, eight, six, and 19 snails. What is the average number of snails per quadrant? They might not ask you this as a first step, but you just got to know how um, know to do it so that when they ask the question of how, what is the estimated population, you'll have this average number. So your average number, you just add up all of this and divide by six, and we got um, 11. Um, as the average number of snails per population. We then um, multiply it by uh, the total area of, the, of the, um, the, the area that we're working with, which is 40 meters squared, and we divide it by the area of each quadrant, which is 0.5 meters squared. Remember to put your units in, so 11 times 40 meters squared over 0.5 meters squared, and your answer is 880 snails. It then asks how would the, um, the estimate have differed if only quadrants two and five were counted? So only um, the one with 16 and the one with 19 were counted. Well, we know that the estimated number of snails in the population would be a lot greater um, because these two areas have very high um, populations in the sample. So the average number of snails per quadrant would be a lot bigger. Um, and you'd actually get, when you work it out, you'd get an estimated population of 1,400 snails as opposed to 880 snails. If we then look at predator-prey relationships, all living organisms within an ecosystem are interdependent. That means they rely on each other. Changes in the population size of one species can drastically affect that of another. That's related to interdependence. It's particularly clear when we look at the relationship between predators and prey. Predation is a biological interaction where one species, the predator, kills and eats another species, the prey. The predator and the prey evolve together and they're part of the same environment. The role that predators play in the environment helps create and maintain greater diversity within an ecosystem. So predators have quite an important role to play in an environment. Some of the things they um, do to regulate the population and to maintain diversity within an ecosystem is they regulate the abundance and distribution of prey species. So as the predator population increases, the prey population decreases, obviously, because if there are more lions, there's more impala eaten, more impala died, or whatever. Predators also increase the biodiversity of communities by preventing a single species from becoming dominant. And in doing so, they prevent a single species from reaching carrying capacity 
and exceeding the carrying capacity and possibly destroying the ecosystem. Predators also keep the prey population genetically fit by removing the sick, injured and weak individuals. And they provide a vital food source for scavengers. Uh, the feeding relationship between the predator and the prey determines the size of the two populations. So it's a negative feedback loop. As the um, predator increases, the prey decreases. As the predator decreases, the prey increases. Um, if we look here, this would be a typical predator-prey graph, and it's, they'll sometimes ask you to draw it, where the prey starts, so the prey is always the one um, more to the left, which happens earlier in time. And um, when the prey increases, eventually when there's a few prey, the predator population will begin to increase. As the predator population increases and, releases and reaches its maximum, the prey population decreases drastically. Now that there's very little prey, there's no food for the predators, so the predators will begin to decrease. As the predators begin to decrease, it gives the prey an opportunity to start increasing again, and so on. Um, you can look at this. This is a more uh, typical one, but they probably wouldn't ask you this, something so um, more complicated as this. They'd probably ask you something a bit simpler in your test. So some of the things that will affect the kinks would be um, like birth and death rates, which are actually not affected by predation at all. Um, and usually what happens is the um, prey population is a lot higher than the predator population. So this is a little bit inaccurate in that they're the same height. This is really, really simplified. Usually the prey pop I mean the predator population will be a bit smaller. Um, if we look at aphids and ladybirds, for example, aphids are insects that suck the sap of different plants. They're parasitic pests and they fed on by ladybirds. So ladybirds are the predator, aphids are the prey. How food webs impact on populations. So a food web is an interconnected set of all the food chains in an ecosystem. There are multiple food webs that are made up of carnivores, herbivores, producers, scavengers, decomposers, all of which help to keep the ecosystems healthy and balanced. To achieve this, the population of species that make up a food web must be kept in balance to keep the ecosystems healthy and balanced. Removing just one species from a food web can have a huge impact on the populations of many other species. So this could be a food web, a really simplified one, obviously, where we start with grass and other plants who are then eaten by um, insects and animals, who are then eaten by other insects and other animals, um, and all of which are when they decompose are eaten by bacteria. We can see that if we take out just one uh, species, so let's say we take out the rabbit, now the rattlesnake has less food, the hawk has less food, bacteria has less uh, food, the grass is not being eaten, and the star cactus isn't being eaten, which means that these two might grow uncontrollably. Um, the rattlesnake and the hawk that eats the rabbit might uh, decrease because they have less prey. You can see how it affects all of those. And then because there's less rattlesnakes, um, tarantulas might increase in population, there's less hawks. So lizards might increase in population and so on. That would be um, um, an example of how just removing one species affects the entire food web. If we then look at competition, this is quite an important uh, subsection. When resources such as light, space, water, or food, or shelter become scarce, individuals have to compete with each other to survive. Competition is when two or more individuals compete for the same resources that are in short supply. Competition can be a powerful force affecting the growth, distribution, and size of populations in nature. There are two types of population, intraspecific and interspecific. Intraspecific co co competition occurs between individuals of the same species. So this would usually be competition for mates, as well as for resources like light, space, food, water, and shelter. And this is the most intense type of competition because members of the same species will have similar habitats and resource requirements. They'll all need the same type of food, the same type of shelter. They'll all want mates, that sort of thing. If we then look at interspecific com competition, this occurs between individuals of different populations who have similar niches in a habitat. E.g. tadpoles and small fish um, might compete for some of the same resources in a pond. So what is a niche? An ecological niche, it niche is um, the, the um, 
what happens in ecological niche is when two species with the same or similar ecological niches occupy the same habitat, their niches will overlap. This can result in specialization among closely related species. So it causes um, species to specialize. For example, the Galapagos finches evolved a large variety of beak shapes and sizes to suit their own type of food so that they didn't have to compete for the same resources. They therefore created their own ecological niches to prevent competition. So an ecological niche is just basically the um, any food or resources required by an organism to survive. Um, sometimes we'll see a niche described as the role an organism might play in an ecosystem. Um, it's similar to an ecological niche, which is just the resources needed for an um, organism to survive. So if two organisms have very similar niches, they'll have very similar requirements and therefore specialization might need to occur to prevent or to decrease competition. Specialization is the structural and behavioral adaptations that enable individuals of a different species to coexist. So to live together without too much competition. The competition that arises from overlapping ecological niches, so needing similar resources and doing similar activities, can also lead to one of two possible outcomes, competitive exclusion or competitive coexistence. Competitive exclusion occurs when one of two competing species is much more successful than the other. So the successful species survives and will increase in size and the other will disappear completely. It can even result in extinction and it plays an important role in the process of evolution. For example, in Africa, there was a lot of um, competition between monkeys and lemurs. Monkeys totally outcompeted lemurs in Africa, which resulted in competitive exclusion. So now lemurs are only found in the island of Madagascar, which was, which is obviously part of the continent of Africa, but was part of the land part of Africa, but split away from it millions of years ago as a result of continental drift. So on Madagascar, lemurs were successful, but in Africa, they were outcompeted by monkeys. So if we looked here at a population density uh, graph, the one um, successful population would continue to increase and stabilize around carrying capacity, whereas the unsuccessful organism would increase and then they would be outcompeted and they would decrease and possibly lead to extinction. The other thing that can happen when there is similar um, ecological niches is competitive coexistence. This arises when two competing species coexist in the same habitat, so they live both of them together. Although they do have overlapping niches and they do compete for the same resources, they can coexist because they use the resources slightly differently. And this is what we call resource partitioning. Resource partitioning is the evolutionary process whereby species with similar requirements living in the same habitat evolve specialized traits that enable them to utilize the resources differently, creating separate niches to reduce interspecific competition and make coexistence possible. So it's basically when two organisms living in the same or two species living in the same habitat that need similar resources and requirements to survive, they each evolve specialized traits that allow them to use resources differently at different times, use different resources, and therefore create separate roles in the environment, reducing competition and allowing them to both live together successfully. Um, a lot of the diversity on Earth is due to, part, due to resource partitioning. Some of the ways that species can eliminate competition is by using the resource at different times, for example, at night or during the day, in different parts of a habitat, um, for example, different species of fish feeding on the same resource but at different depths and in different parts of the same plant. For example, some giraffe feeding on the top part of um, a tree and kudu feeding on the lower leaves of the same tree. In plants, resource partitioning is also quite an important strategy and this kind of question can be asked, sometimes ask it for four, five, six marks, just saying describe resource partitioning in a forest or something like that. Um, what you've got to do is just explain this process that I'm going to take you through. So indigenous forests are complex community. There are many different trees and other plants, many different species of varying size and structure. And they create a vertical structure that divides the vegetation into layers. This is called stratification. And this is how plants do resource partitioning through stratification. 
The conditions at the uppermost level are totally different from those at the forest floor, things like light intensity, wind speed, humidity, and so on. And there would be four layers, usually four layers. They'll sometimes have slightly different names, but in general, the top layer would be the emergent layer. We then have the canopy layer, then the understory layer, and at the bottom we'll have the forest floor. So the forest ecosystem is made up of some tall trees, things like yellowwoods and stinkwoods. They have the most light intensity. They have the high, the upper canopy, the emergent layer, and they obviously have the most light intensity because they're most exposed to the sunlight. There's then other shorter trees, which are in the canopy layer, um, and they have slightly less light intensity. Pioneer species, which are the first plants to grow in an area, and young trees such as the Cape beech are found growing in the gaps between the trees. Epiphytes, like lichens, mistletoe, and orchids, draw, grow on tree trunks, and climbers also um, twine around the branches. They'd usually be in the understory layer. And then there's the herbaceous ground layer, which has things like ferns and shade-loving plants, so plants that don't need so much light intensity, and things like grasses and dicotyledons. So light is obviously partitioned. Light is a very important resource. And light diminishes as it, um, the rays pass through the different layers of vegetation in the forest. So the greatest light intensity is up here. And as light passes through the forest, we now have the least amount of light intensity in the forest floor. Um, and different plants need different amounts of light intensity. So those that need a lot of light intensity will usually be the tall trees. And those with less will be the um, smaller trees. These plants have adapted to photosynthesize, to photosynthesize in different light intensities. There's then also competitive strategies and resource partitioning strategies among animals. Um, if we look at large herbivores, things like giraffe and kudu are both browsers, they both eat leaves in woodland savannah areas. The giraffe has a long neck and legs, so its whole body is adapted to browsing on the high leaves and the tall trees and in the top branches of the trees. They feed on species like um, acacia trees. They have a tongue and lips that are tough, allowing them to withstand the vicious thorns. And some animals obviously don't have tongue and a tough tongue and lips like this, so they can't eat plants from thorny trees. This allows giraffe to eat plants that um, some other animals may not be able to eat. For example, thorny plants and plants and leaves at the top of trees. Um, and then there would be things that, like kudu, who initially at the outset would look like they want the same food as the giraffe. They both want to eat leaves. But the giraffe wants or is able to eat the leaves at the top of the trees and thorny leaves. Kudu will eat um, a different range of leaves. They're not really known to eat grass. They'll utilize a lot of um, a wider range of trees than some other antelopes. And they like to eat the young shoots and the leaves. But they can also eat seed pods of trees, as opposed to um, the giraffe, who would eat these sort of um, leaves. Kudu would eat seed pods, young shoots, and obviously lower down in the bush. Um, they share many of their preferred species with giraffe, so they do have the, some of the same resources, things like combretum, kudu thorn acacia, um, but there's very little competition because kudu browse on the lower branches and giraffe on the upper branches. This allows the resource, so food or leaves, to be partitioned. There's also um, competition between predators, for example, lions and leopards. Um, obviously, many ecosystems have multiple predator species, that compete for shared prey. And they're also threats to each other. If a lion sees a leopard or a leopard cub or something, they'll often uh, kill each other. They're both opportunistic, skilled hunters and they both stalk their prey. They can coexist through resource partitioning. So some of the strategies for that would be to hunt at different times of day. Leopards usually hunt at night and um, lions often hunt in the early morning or at night. So they might both, ha both hunt at night, but then they'd use these other types of um, resource partitioning strategies. Things like cheetah um, prefer to hunt um, during the day. They will hunt at night, but they pretty much usually hunt during the day, whereas leopards hunt at night, which allows them to um, avoid competition in that way. Lions and leopards and other predators will also hunt different types of prey. Lions usually prefer a medium to larger size prey like wildebeers, zebras, um, even giraffe, buffalo. Leopards have a lot of smaller prey, like a small antelope, impala, stienbok, um, monkeys, if they can catch them, that sort of thing. That also allows them to coexist by dietary niche separation. That's what um, they eat different food. 
They can also hunt in different areas of the habitat. Lions are a lot larger and heavier, which means that they dominate quite a few of the areas as opposed to leopards. But leopards are a lot more fast and agile, um, so they can um, hunt in places that lions may not be able to reach or um, they'll often hunt um, in very thick bushes um, that lions may not even be able to um, access. Leopards obviously can also climb trees, allowing them to um, keep their prey safe from lions and from other scavengers. And they can even hunt from the tree by dropping down on the prey. Those would be um, some of the ways that these predators reduce competition. Um, so that's the first part of population ecology. There's a few more um, videos that will be coming out in the next few days.